this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's video. On today's video, I want to discuss with you some topics that uh, I'm certain you're going to find fascinating, and you may find them at times to be a little bit controversial uh, and perhaps even a little sensitive, but we're going to delve right in uh, and tackle some tough issues that we face as qualified medical evaluators. Now the material that I'm going to share with you today is extracted from two uh, QME continuing education home study programs. The first uh, home study program is entitled the non-physiologic examination and we're going to talk all, all today uh, about the non-physiologic examination. Now the home study program that I'm referencing, the non-physiologic exam, uh, is a three-hour continuing education home study program. And in that program, I discuss in great depth and great detail all of the issues uh, surrounding symptom magnification, malingering, deception, and the non-physiologic examination maneuvers. Then in another one of my home study uh, programs entitled The 21 Secrets of the Most Persuasive QMEs, I touch briefly uh, on topics related to the non-physiologic examination and I want to elaborate on some of those ideas with today's video. Now we certainly don't have uh, three hours of time to uh, conduct videotaping here today and I'm certain a three hour videotape would probably bore you to death. So I want to concentrate today on some of the most uh, important issues uh, relating to symptom magnification, to deception, to malingering, and then I want to talk about uh, two important points. Number one is the necessity, the necessity, all caps, necessity, uh, of incorporating non-physiologic examination maneuvers into your routine examination protocol. So that's number one. And then number two, I want to talk about uh, actually how to do non-physiologic examination maneuvers. We're going to spend most of our time uh, on topic number one, the necessity. And then uh, I will give some suggestions as to how to incorporate uh, these maneuvers into your routine physical examination. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to make an entirely separate video uh, on the non-physiologic examination maneuvers and exactly how to do non-physiologic examination maneuvers. So uh, our primary focus for today's video will be focusing on the necessity uh, of the non-physiologic examination. And uh, throughout uh, today's video, I'm going to be referencing uh, three important sources. Uh, and I'm not sure if you have these reference textbooks or not, uh, but I'm certain you have the AMA guides, and I'm going to reference the AMA guides. Then I'm going to reference the 2001 Physician's Guide. And some of you out there might be wondering, well, <laughs> what in the world is the 2001 Physician's Guide? And uh, what does that have to do with anything that we're doing now in 2014? Well, uh, let me just say that it is true that we uh, almost never, I say almost never, uh, use the 2001 Physician's Guide now in 2014. Uh, but there are still a few occasional times, uh, especially for injuries prior to 2005, when we still use the 2001 Physician's Guide as we rate permanent disability rather than permanent impairment for injuries prior to 2005. And prior to 2005 with the adoption of the AMA Guides, uh, the 2001 Physician's Guide uh, was our Bible, just as the AMA guys is our Bible now. So it's interesting because even though we no longer use <clears throat> the 2001 Physician's Guide, or almost never use it, the 2001 Physician's Guide has some brilliant philosophy in it that still applies and will probably apply uh, all the way into antiquity uh, to the work that we do. And the philosophy of the 2001 Physician's Guide, it's interesting, it very closely matches and mirrors uh, the philosophy of the AMA Guides. And there's some fascinating parallels between the 2001 Physician's Guide on the one hand and the AMA Guides on the other hand. So as we get into our discussion regarding deception, symptom magnification, and malingering, 
I'm going to draw upon these two reference textbooks, which are seemingly divergent textbooks, but I'm going to show you how the concepts uh, in both of these references run parallel. And we'll talk about what these two references have to say about uh, these important topics. And then uh, finally, uh, I'm going to be referencing the diagnostic and statistics <laughs> the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the so-called DSM-4. And I don't anticipate that many of you will have the DSM-4 unless you're a practicing psychologist or a practicing psychiatrist. But I'm going to draw upon uh, some important quotations from the DSM-4 uh, as relates to symptom magnification and malingering. So I have a brilliant program for you today. I want you to brace yourself because we're going to be talking about uh, some topics that sometimes prove to be uh, sensitive and controversial. And some of these topics are uh, areas where it seems that some people are apprehensive to go. <laughs> well, uh, true to my nature, we're going to delve right in there today and we're going to attack head on some of these sensitive topics because uh, as much as we may try to pretend that deception, uh, symptom magnification, and malingering uh, don't exist, they actually do exist. So we need to confront these uh, ideas head on and simply learn how to handle it. Because uh, we're going to be confronted with examinees who uh, do magnify their symptoms and do try to deceive us. Uh, and we're going to be encountering examinees who uh, are uh, malingering in certain uh, situations and certain circumstances. So uh, let's learn how to handle this head on together. So I give you a minute now to go ahead and get your AMA guides because uh, I want you to read along with me as I reference uh, certain sections in the AMA guides. If you have the 2001 Physician's Guide handy, go get that too because I'm going to be referring to uh, some specific citations uh, from that textbook as well. So I'll give you a minute to go ahead and uh, collect up those resources and I uh, look forward to being back with you here in just a minute as we talk about deception, symptom magnification, malingering, and the non-physiologic examination. here with me. I uh, hope you have your AMA guides uh, with you as well. And uh, I want to begin our discussion now uh, regarding the topics of deception, symptom magnification, and malingering. And I want to tack these uh, topics uh, head on. And uh, as we go along with today's material, I'm going to explain to you why it's important uh, that we always be on the lookout for deception, symptom magnification, and malingering. And I want to impress upon you why that's actually necessary and part of our uh, duty as qualified medical evaluators to be aware of these issues. Because in the end, uh, when it comes down to it, uh, our responsibility as qualified medical evaluators is to provide accurate opinions and conclusions uh, about the examinee's true condition. And uh, if you have any experience doing qualified medical evaluations, you'll agree with me that uh, many times examinees come in with uh, a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> and it's up to us to swim through the fog and to arrive at a conclusion and an opinion regarding the examinee's true condition that's accurate. It's an accurate representation 
of their true condition. And sometimes it's not easy because uh, examinees are all different. And uh, we have to rely upon some certain basic principles if we're going to get to the promised land. And the promised land is that point where our accurates are accurate, they're responsible, and they're what's uh, uh, called or what's defined as uh, substantial medical evidence. That's the term of art that we use uh, nowadays in this profession. So to begin our discussion about uh, these topics, I want to start with the uh, AMA guides. And uh, the AMA guides uh, touch briefly upon uh, these topics, symptom magnification and malingering. And to start us off, I just want to uh, establish a little bit of philosophy uh, about examinees in general. And this comes out of uh, chapter 18, which is the pain-related impairment chapter. And in chapter 18, they spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about the pain behaviors. And uh, for those of you that have been following this video series, you know that I uh, made an entire video over one hour discussion uh, on the pain behaviors that's published on my website. And if you're interested in that, you can access that on my website. The video is simply entitled uh, The Pain Behaviors. So I want to refer uh, briefly back to one of the ideas uh, relating to pain behaviors. And this is from the AMA guides on page 579, second column. And in this section, the AMA guides are talking to us about the different types of examinees that we can expect to see uh, in the permanent impairment evaluation. Now, the authors of the AMA guides, uh, we agree, uh, are credible sources. And we agree that the AMA, the, the authors of the AMA guides uh, are reliable references. So since we use the AMA guides, uh, we rely upon uh, these chapters. Well, in chapter 18, the AMA guides are quite frank in discussing uh, the different types of examinees that we can expect to see. So let's see what the AMA guides say. The AMA guys say, uh, page 579, second column, second paragraph, they say that some individuals, meaning some of the examinees that we're going to see, uh, appear stoic as they go through evaluations. And the pain behaviors that they do demonstrate are concordant with other medical information regarding their condition. Concordant means that, uh, means in agreement with. So what they're saying is that some of the uh, examinees that we're going to see, they demonstrate pain behaviors that are in agreement with other medical information regarding their condition. Okay, so this is the type of examinee that you would consider to be uh, a credible examinee, a bona fide examinee, uh, an examinee who had uh, a bona fide incident of injury, had a documented injury, uh, and is now presenting for their evaluation. And this is what the AMA guides are alluding to and what you've probably experienced uh, as a credible examinee, okay? Well, <laughs> the AMA guides say, uh, in the very next paragraph, they say, uh, at the opposite extreme, at the opposite extreme, okay, so let's just stop right there. What that means is that the credible, bona fide examinee that they just described to us, the one that appears stoic, he is at one extreme. And there's a range, and then we arrive at the opposite extreme, where we're going to talk about this particular examinee. So at the opposite extreme, an individual may demonstrate pain behaviors that appear exaggerated and disconcordant, not in agreement, disconcordant, with his or her presumed medical condition. Okay? So let's diagram this out. 
and I'm going to be diagramming this out. I hope you can see this. Okay. So the AMA guides tell us that here, at one end of the extreme, we have an examinee who's credible. Let's just call this credible. I hope you can see this. Who presents with credible pain behaviors. At the opposite end of the extreme is an examinee who presents with exaggerated. We'll just call that exag. <laughs> okay. And the AMA guys describe this as the two extremes. Well, let's draw this on a graph. If we were to evaluate, uh, let's say, 1,000 examinees, and I simply want you to think about uh, your own experience in examining injured workers. If we were to examine 1,000 examinees, how many examinees would we find here? How many examinees would we find here? And how many examinees would we find somewhere in the middle? Would you agree with me that it's probably some sort of a bell-shaped curve? Now this bell can be shifted one way or the other, but could we agree just for the purposes of this video that uh, examinees are going to present at some point along the spectrum of presenting with credible pain behaviors and or exaggerated pain behaviors. So from as we move from this extreme, from the credible end of the extreme, we see increasing, increasing exaggeration of pain behaviors, increasing deception, increasing symptom magnification, and even the possibility uh, of malingering. Quite an interesting concept. You might, uh, you might agree with me that this is quite a fascinating concept, that these represent two extremes. So according to the AMA guides, we're going to see examinees who present with exaggerated pain behaviors. We can predict it. We can anticipate it. We should expect it. We should learn together now how to handle it. Okay? Okay. Now, you may wonder <clears throat> to yourself, you may be wondering, well, what would motivate an examinee uh, to present with exaggerated pain behaviors and to come to the evaluation presenting themselves in a way uh, that's disconcordant or not in agreement uh, with the mechanism of injury, with the medical history as it's described in the medical records, what would cause a person to come in uh, and uh, behave this way? Well, uh, again, the AMA guides, uh, in their wisdom, they touch upon this. Uh, and they give us at least a couple of ideas as to why, as to why. So again, uh, page 579, second column, third paragraph, the guides say that these pain behaviors, these exaggerated pain behaviors, these disconcordant pain behaviors, may appear to be driven by a variety of factors. There's a variety of factors. And the guides give us at least two. Uh, number one, such as overwhelming somatic anxiety. Number two, or the person's desire to convince an examiner that he or she is suffering greatly. So let's just talk about these two. These are just two examples that the AMA guide cites. The AMA guides tell us that there's a variety of factors, and we're going to talk about some more of these factors. But let's just talk about these two specific examples that uh, the AMA guide cites. They say, uh, overwhelming somatic anxiety. So let me ask you, uh, have you ever had an examinee show up to their QME examination uh, a little anxious? Yeah, sure. 
examinees do show up to the uh, evaluation a little bit anxious, correct? And just like pain behaviors that we demonstrated on the uh, whiteboard, anxiety runs a whole range. Some people are not very anxious. Some people are overwhelmingly, uh, have overwhelming somatic anxiety, and there's a bell-shaped curve in between. So we can anticipate that our examinees uh, are going to be a little bit anxious coming to the qualified medical evaluation. Number two is that the examinee has a desire to convince the examiner that he or she is suffering greatly. So let me ask you, uh, do examinees in the workers' compensation system, do claimants, do injured workers uh, who ultimately become patients in some doctor's treatment office, do these people, uh, do they suffer greatly in the workers' compensation system? Let me ask you, do they suffer greatly? Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do, at least from their perspective. From their perspective, they've got a variety of issues that, uh, to them, uh, is perceived as terrible, uh, as a rotten deal, as they're suffering greatly, as they're not getting proper medical treatment, and they're not getting their payments on time, and their boss doesn't understand them, and no one at work will speak to them anymore, and all these issues <laughs> that examinees tell us, from their perspective, they are suffering greatly. And so when they come to the qualified medical evaluation, uh, they see us as evaluators as someone that they can unload this onto so that they can get it off their shoulders and, and put it onto our shoulders. And so sometimes they, they lay it on, they lay it on heavy, they lay it on thick. And they may embellish their symptoms and they may embellish their story and they may exaggerate and they may even malinger. And the guides tell us that we can anticipate this in advance just because of the very nature of the workers compensation system uh, can cause examinees or claimants or injured workers whatever you want to call them uh, can cause them to unnecessarily suffer and so we can anticipate that so the take home message from this in the AMA guides is that uh, it's the rare examinee who's the totally credible, stoic, concordant examinee. And then at the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's a rare examinee who uh, totally fabricates their whole deal. But the majority of people are going to lie somewhere in between on the spectrum. And it's possible uh, that they will embellish and exaggerate their symptoms and exaggerate their pain behaviors. The AMA guides tell us to anticipate that. Okay? So that's the first point I want to establish with you here. Second thing I want to talk to you about today uh, is malingering. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about malingering and the necessity, therefore, uh, of performing non-physiologic examination maneuvers. And I'll establish uh, the necessity of non-physiologic examination maneuvers uh, once we handle this point. Now, imagine this, lo and behold, <laughs> the AMA guides discuss, briefly, they discuss malingering uh, in chapter 18. Can you imagine that? The authors of the AMA guides, in their combined wisdom and experience, thought it important to discuss malingering in chapter 18. So, let's review what the AMA guides uh, say about malingering, and then we'll compare that uh, with uh, other definitions of malingering uh, that we have available to us. So in chapter 18, and this is on page 585, they have a section entitled Malingering, right here. The AMA guides say that malingering is conscious deception for the purpose of gain for the purpose of gain. To gain what? what? What are they trying to gain? 
Well, in the workers' compensation system, the workers' compensation system is a compensation system. It's a benefit delivery system that provides benefits such as temporary disability benefits, medical treatment benefits, permanent disability benefits, benefits, benefits in the form of compensations. So in the workers' compensation system, the gain is in the form of either direct financial compensation or in benefits such as <clears throat> medical treatment. Okay, so it's conscious deception for the purpose of gain. Okay? Now, the AMA guys say that most authorities declare that malingering is quite uncommon, meaning it's at the far end of the spectrum. They say that it's quite uncommon. There appear, appear to be few data regarding its frequency few data about the frequency of malingering. But the AMA guides, uh, they dig up some data and they share some of the, some of the available data with us here uh, in chapter 18. So they first go on and they say, mm, there's not a lot of data, but uh, we have some data. So let's talk about the data that the AMA guides considers to be important that we understand uh, in evaluating our injured workers. They say that uh, one author, his name is Fishbane, Fishbane, uh, Fishbane reviewed literature suggesting that malingering is present in 1.25% to 10.4% of individuals with chronic pain. Up to 10% of individuals with chronic pain uh, will malinger, will consciously try to deceive uh, the examiner, the doctor, for the purpose of gain. And we can speculate as to what it is uh, that they're trying to gain, but up to 10%. Okay? 10%. Okay. So store that back in your memory bank, up to 10%. Um, the AMA guides give us a couple of other studies to consider. Uh, they uh, dug up some studies about uh, examinees with uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. And they found that uh, in individuals with unexplained intractable diarrhea, unexplained intractable diarrhea, meaning these people went into the doctor and they said, I have diarrhea. I have diarrhea. And the doctor said, well, what's the cause of that? And the people said, I don't know. <laughs> it's unexplained intractable diarrhea. Doctor says, what's causing your diarrhea? They had no idea. They found that 14% of these people that had no idea why they had diarrhea, they had positive stool examinations for laxatives. Although all of them denied the use of laxatives. What would cause a person to use laxatives to stimulate diarrhea and then deny the use of laxatives? Some sort of gain. We don't know from this study what they're seeking to gain, but malingering is a conscious deception for the purpose of gain. Uh, another study found that uh, among 333 people who claimed compensation for noise-induced hearing loss, noise-induced hearing loss, these are people that work uh, at the airport in loud factories, around uh, uh, loud machines, etc. They had noise-induced hearing loss. The incidence of exaggeration on hearing tests was 17.7%. They exaggerated on hearing tests. In other words, these examinees said, uh, when, when a tone was put in their ears, they said, uh, no, I don't hear it. And they turned the tone up and they said, no, I don't hear it. And they turned the tone up and the examinee said, I don't hear it. <laughs> but meanwhile, through the use of cortical evoked response audiometry testing, sensitive testing, they found 
through this testing that indeed the examinee was hearing the stimulus and yet they denied being able to hear the stimulus. 17.7% .7 of these people who were uh, applying for compensation due to hearing loss. Finally, uh, another author, his name is Weintraub, he cites studies showing that 20% to 46%, 20 to 46, 46 is almost 50%, correct? If we assume 46% was 50%, if we round it up, okay, if we round it up a bit, 50%, that's one in two. That's 50%. <laughs> one in two, every other person, okay? Well, he says that 20 to 46 percent of people consider purposeful misrepresentation of compensation claims to be acceptable behavior. They consider it. They consider uh, purposeful misrepresentation. What does that mean? That means exaggeration. That means symptom magnification. That means malingering. Okay, purposeful misrepresentation. They consider that to be okay they consider that to be acceptable behavior and think about it think about it how many cases have you seen how many auto accident cases how many personal injury cases how many workers compensation cases uh, have you heard about maybe you've been involved in some of those yourself there's something that takes place in the mind when it's seeking gain especially when seeking compensation that uh, allows a little hyperbole <laughs> allows a little speculation, allows a little exaggeration, and it's okay. And Weintraub says that 50% of people, up to 50%, they consider this to be okay. We need to realize this and we need to understand this when we go into our qualified medical evaluations. Okay? So I want to give you a minute just to think about these two ideas. Take home message from these ideas is that Malingering, symptom magnification are common in compensation systems. Compensation systems include, of course, the system that we're in. We're in the workers' compensation system. But it's also common in other compensation and entitlement and disability systems. It's common in the Social Security disability system. It's common in the military with the uh, application for Veterans Administration benefits. It's common in auto accident cases where accident victims uh, are seeking compensation. And you've seen those metaphors of the people in court with the cervical collars on up to here. And we're all familiar with these images and these metaphors. Well, the AMA guides tell us that we should anticipate this. We should expect it. We should be prepared to deal with it. We should be comfortable, comfortable with this idea. And you know, uh, in my career, uh, I've actually become I've actually become comfortable with symptom magnification. I've come to accept a certain amount of symptom magnification uh, to be normal. Partly for some of the reasons that uh, the AMA guides cite, and that is, by the time people get to us as their evaluators, uh, they're many times frustrated, and they're, they are suffering badly. Uh, they've been poorly treated. They've been doubted. Uh, they've not received what they consider to be proper medical care, and so they're frustrated. And so they get to us, and they just unload the whole thing on us, and they, they really lay it on. And I'm actually, I've actually become comfortable with a certain amount of symptom magnification. So with that said, uh, it's still our responsibility. Our responsibility as examiners and evaluators uh, is to swim through this uh, fog and swim through all the subjectivity that examinees bring to us because they bring us a ton of subjectivity. We have to filter through this mass of exaggeration and get to the bottom line and come up with a construct of an accurate representation of their true condition at the permanent and stationary date and provide for opinions that are supportable and that are substantial. So 
That's our underwriting philosophy for the remainder of this video, that we can expect uh, symptom magnification as a normal part of our routine evaluation. And this should come as no surprise, and I'm sure it's not really a surprise. The only surprise is that we're discussing it openly and honestly. Well, you know what? We're not the only ones. And in our next segment, I'm going to share with you uh, what the perspective of the claims examiner is on symptom magnification. I'm going to share with you the perspective of the defense attorney on symptom magnification. I'm even going to share with you uh, some applicant attorney perspective on these uh, sensitive issues. So I'll give you a minute to uh, mull over and cogitate on those ideas, and I'll be back with you in just a moment as we further explore uh, important concepts related to the non-physiologic examination. out of our last segment. Uh, in this segment I want to go over uh, some different perspectives on symptom magnification and malingering. And that is the perspective of the other parties associated uh, with our claim. Now we tend to be have a myopic kind of view from our own perspective, but I want to share with you uh, some ideas uh, from the perspective of the claims administrator, from the defense attorney and even from the applicant attorney. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, would an applicant attorney uh, want us as evaluators to consider that the examinee might be exaggerating their symptoms and the examinee might actually be malingering? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Applicant attorneys are concerned about credible examinees. They don't want to represent uh, examinees that are not bona fide examinees. Uh, examinees that are not bona fide examinees uh, make everyone look bad and applicant attorneys do not want to be associated with examinees who are malingering and so uh, even the applicant attorneys concerned that we render conclusions that are accurate that are supportable and that are substantial no one wants us to render uh, conclusions that aren't accurate and I don't know about you, but I've uh, many times rendered permanent impairment ratings uh, that were escalated, that were inflated, that were exaggerated. And I uh, can't tell you how many times I've been embarrassed and chagrined uh, to, the, to later see a Sub Rosa surveillance video taping that demonstrate the examinee to be doing activities uh, that I said in my report that they cannot do. And every time that happened, uh, it was very embarrassing and I felt quite foolish. And I vowed that I would not, that would not happen again. That I would not be deceived by examinees. That my whole motive is to get to the truth of the condition to get through the subjectivity, to get through the exaggeration, which the AMA guides tell us we can expect. But we have to get through it and get to an accurate home base. And so it's the purpose of our whole discussion today. So the, exam, uh, the claims examiners, the defense attorneys, and the applicants, they all want the same thing. They all have no problem with accurate and substantial conclusions. Well, I want to share with you uh, some specific language from each of these parties and show you why it's necessary for us and why it's incumbent on us that we actually do a non-physiologic examination. 
Now I have to tell you a story. Uh, I was recently at a QME continuing education seminar in Southern California and uh, I was the speaker there. And uh, as I was discussing with the audience the non-physiologic examination and uh, concepts regarding non-physiologic examination maneuvers and all this stuff that we're, we're going over today, uh, I asked the audience to please raise your hand if you perform non-physiologic examination maneuvers. <laughs> and as I looked out upon the sea of confused faces, I found that very few doctors uh, integrate non-physiologic examination maneuvers into their routine protocol. Many doctors have never considered the possibility uh, that examinees could exaggerate. And so, uh, let's see what the claims examiner and the defense attorney uh, and the applicant attorney say about symptom magnification. And this is going to serve to reinforce our theme today, which is that it's necessary, it's necessary to integrate a non-physiologic exam. Okay? Well, the first one I want to share with you, uh, I have three cover letters here. The first one comes from uh, a defense attorney. And uh, I'll cover up the demographic information here. But we're all familiar with cover letters, correct? We're all familiar with cover letters. First thing I want to say about cover letters is, number one, when you get a cover letter, make sure to read the cover letter in its entirety and read all of the questions in their entirety. Because many times these cover letters, uh, they're not just form letters. They may look like they're form letters and sometimes they are just form letters. But even when they're form letters, many times the questions have customized uh, content integrated within what is otherwise templated language. So you need to read the cover letters uh, thoroughly. Many times the cover letters are specifically and custom written regarding uh, your exact examinee. And always address all of the questions on the cover letter. Let me say that again. Always, how often? <laughs> always, always address all the questions that are given to you on the cover letter. After all, they sent you the cover letter. They sent you the cover letter. So address all questions, even if it seems that they're simply form questions. They sent it to you. You don't want someone to come to you later and say, well, doctor, you didn't address question number four. What are you going to say? Oh, I thought it was just a form letter? <laughs> no. Don't get caught. Answer every question. Okay? So let's review some of these questions. So we have a cover letter here, and it goes over uh, some basic history, like they always all do. And then, like most cover letters, she finally gets to the point where they request uh, specific answers to some questions. It says, it's respectfully requested that you issue a narrative medical legal report to address the following questions. And they list a series of questions. Well, I have one highlighted here that I simply want to read to you. It says here, uh, please discuss whether symptom magnification or malingering are indicated here. Here meaning in this particular case. Please discuss whether symptom magnification or malingering are indicated here. And then the claims examiner gives me a specific example uh, from the history of behavior that the claims examiner considers to be disconcordant. Disconcordant. Remember our word disconcordant means not in agreement. The examiner gives me an example of, dis of what she suspects uh, may be disconcordant behavior. She says, would you expect that a person with the complaints as voiced by uh, Mr. Jones to be able to drive over 150 miles each way from his home in Sacramento to his chiropractor's office in San Jose, California? Well, 
Well, let's think about this. The claims examiner asked me to, it's respectfully requested that you address the following questions. And then she gives me a question. Is symptom magnification or malingering indicated here? Would you expect a person with the complaints voiced by Mr. Jones to be able to drive over 150 miles each way from his home in Sacramento to his chiropractor's office in San Jose? The claims examiner is concerned and she wants me to address it. And I know you've received these cover letters as well. So let's think about this. 150 miles each way, which is 300 miles round trip. Okay. Now, 300 miles round trip uh, would take the better part of a day. It would take a bite right out of the middle part uh, of any day. And most examinees or most injured workers, when they have chiropractic treatments, it's two to three days a week, correct? So we have an examinee going 300 miles two to three days per week, okay? So if this examinee has a chiropractic appointment at, say, uh, noon, 12 noon, he would have to leave his house uh, considering traffic and all that stuff, probably around 8.30 in the morning. And he would be at the chiropractor's office for about 30 minutes, let's say, getting his treatment. Then he would get back in his car uh, somewhere around 12.30. Uh, and with traffic and what have you, he'd probably get home somewhere around, well, 12.30, 1.30, 2.30, 3.30, somewhere around 3.30, 4, 3, 4, somewhere in that time frame. So he left his house at 8.30, getting home at 3.30. That's the better part of a day, two to three days a week. Would you expect that a person with the complaints, well, what are the complaints? The complaints are pain, 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 pain. Can't do anything, pain. Can't work, pain. Can't do activities of daily living, pain. Let me ask you, would you consider that disconcordant? It could be. It could be. It could be, couldn't it? 300 miles round trip. Apparently, Mr. Jones can handle this trip, but he can't handle his work duties. She's asking me to discuss the possibility of symptom magnification or malingering. Okay? Well, what about the defense attorney? What are the defense attorney's concerns? Let's go over a defense attorney letter. Okay, so this is a cover letter from defense attorney. I'll come up, cover up the demographic data. <laughs> and uh, this is incredible. <laughs> it says right here, I don't know if you can see this, but right here, it says, in bold, please read entire cover letter prior to examination. Please respond to all questions in this cover letter. They're telling me that this is not simply a form letter. So you need to make sure you read the cover letters and address all the issues in the cover letter. Okay? So this cover letter starts out with some history uh, and stuff. And then it goes on to the questions, and it says, these are the specific issues to be addressed in the comprehensive medical legal report. They're asking me to address these issues. And I have here and highlighted uh, the one that's relating to what we're talking about. And this is question 2D. So before we get to 2D, uh, let's just talk about question 2. Question 2 says, did the applicant sustain an industrially related injury, either as a result of specific injury, cumulative trauma, or both? Question mark. On what basis did you reach this determination? So this is the causation question. This is the AOE-COE. The claims adjuster, the claims examiner is saying, hey, hey, did this person suffer an injury or not? 
and your answer better be good, she says. He says. He says, on what basis did you reach this determination? In other words, you better explain your answer pretty good, and it better be good. What's behind this question? What's behind this question? This is not the type of question that's posed to us when we have an examinee who uh, falls off a scaffold in front of the company owner, in front of the supervisor, in front of the manager, and in front of ten co-workers. That's not a concern. That's a specific witnessed injury, correct? In this particular case, the examiner, the claims examiner, is concerned. They're asking us, is there an injury here or not? And you better explain it good, because the tone is, they don't believe that there's an injury. Okay? And they're asking me to address it. Then she says, uh, please thoroughly, please thoroughly <laughs> address the following in your report. And here we get to question 2D. She says, are there risk factors for potential symptom magnification, somatization, or malingering? Question mark. For example, job dissatisfaction, emotional trauma, substance abuse, etc. She says, do you recommend a Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory to evaluate noticeable behavioral factors affecting the patient's perceived level of dysfunction and disability? the patient's perceived level of dysfunction and disability. So what do we have here? We have a patient who perceives their disability and their dysfunction to be great. And the claims examiner uh, is not buying it. She's not buying it. And she wants me to address it. And I know you get these cover letters all the time as well. She wonders, uh, does the patient appear motivated to return to modified work soon? She asks, is the patient's presentation consistent with the observable clinical presentation? Is her behavior consistent with the clinical findings? Fair question, correct? Then she gives some examples. She said, well, is there, is, does she demonstrate the need for intermittent posture change? Does she have difficulty removing clothing? Is there a withdrawal response to light skin touch? This is one of the Waddell's signs, correct? Superficial tenderness is how uh, Gordon Waddell referred to this. She calls it withdrawal response to light skin touch. One of the Waddell signs. Is there a variation in response to straight leg rakes straight leg raise test while supine versus straight leg rest, straight leg raise test while seated. Another one of the distraction maneuvers, one of the Waddell's maneuvers, correct? The examiner, uh, the claims examiner is telling me to do the Waddell's maneuvers here. She's telling me she wants to find out how does this person perform on non-physiologic exam tests. The claims examiner knows about these maneuvers. <laughs> uh, she asks, is there low back pain with passive rotation at the hips while standing? This is one of the simulation maneuvers. This is known as truncal rotation, a maneuver that should not stimulate low back pain. She knows about this maneuver and she says, does the examinee give you pain when you do this maneuver? She's asking me to perform the maneuver. Does the examinee have non-dermatomal, -derma, well she calls it dermatological, she means dermatomal. Does the examinee have non-dermatomal sensory loss on pinwheel testing? Another of the Waddell signs. Waddell referred to this as a non-anatomic pain distribution. Non-anatomic pain distribution. Is there demonstrable effort on tests? Is, does she have exaggerated grimacing? Finally, she asks, uh, has the patient demonstrated maximum effort with active and passive range of motion tests? What's behind these questions? What's behind it is that the examiner uh, is not convinced that this examinee has a bona fide injury, and they're asking us to address it. 
So we have a responsibility to address these questions. We have a responsibility to address AOE, COE. Thus, we have a responsibility to come up with an accurate conclusion on the examinee's true condition. And that requires a good physical examination and a good non-physiologic examination as well. Okay, what about the applicant attorney? So, I have here a cover letter from applicant attorney. I'll cover up the demographic data. Okay. And same format. You've seen these before. It comes with a little bit of history, a couple pages. Then he gets to his questions and he says, In your report, please be sure to address the following. Please be sure. Now, if I submit my report and I don't address his questions, does he have reason to object to my report? Could he come back and say, the doctor didn't address any of my questions? <laughs> He's asking for it. So he has a bunch of questions. And then on page three of the report, he gets straight to the point. And he asks, Number one, are the applicant's subjective complaints supported by objective findings? Fair question, correct? Phrased a little bit differently than the uh, claims examiner phrased it. He comes straight out in the clearest language possible. Are the applicant's subjective complaints supported by objective findings? Then he says, please explain the rationale for your conclusions. In other words, your opinion and conclusion better be good and it better be supportable. He's telling us. Then, listen to this. Listen to this. And this is the whole philosophy of this program. This comes right from the applicant attorney cover letter. This is question number six. He asks, Please perform a physical examination documenting all pertinent positive, negative, and non-physiologic findings, period. As always, comma, your conclusions must be supportable. The examinee is asking whether or not we consider the examinee to be magnifying their symptoms or even possibly malingering. He's asking us to integrate non-physiologic examination maneuvers into our routine examination protocol. Okay, doctors, is that incredible? So what I'm sharing with you here today <clears throat> is not simply uh, my opinion and my experience. Uh, when I have opinions and experience for you, I will preface those by telling you uh, this is uh, just my opinion. And I'll try to support those wherever possible. But I want you to be uh, impressed and convinced uh, and, and in agreement with me that all of this material that I'm sharing with you today uh, is well referenced and, and is fully supported uh, both in citation uh, and the AMA guides and the physician's guide, which we'll get into in just a minute. Uh, and also, uh, the work that we do in our evaluation is supported by the requests of the parties. And so we have an obligation uh, to assess for symptom magnification and to assess for malingering. And we have an obligation to incorporate non-physiologic exam maneuvers into our routine protocol. So if you're in agreement with me on that, <laughs> we can move forward. And uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit more now uh, is some concepts related to malingering. And what I want to share with you now is probably going to be a mind blower for you uh, because we're going to talk right down to the brass tacks uh, about how malingering manifests itself uh, in the qualified medical evaluation. And to start us off, uh, I want to go through a couple of quotes. I'll go through a couple of quotes with you and a couple of definitions of malingering uh, from some credible references uh, that we use. Before I get into that, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our reports. Now, I said at the beginning uh, in the introduction of this video that uh, the material that I'm sharing with you today, in part, 
uh, comes from a six-hour QME continuing education home study program, which is entitled The 21 Secrets of the Most Persuasive QMEs. The Most Persuasive QMEs. And when we produce our QME reports, which is our final product, it's our final work product, it would kind of like being a candle maker handing you her best wax candle or a painter showing you, giving you their best uh, portrait or an author uh, giving you his best uh, book. Our QME report is our work product. It's a reflection of our thoughts, our ideas, our experience our clinical judgment, it represents us. And our QME reports uh, must be persuasive. They have to be good. They have to be substantial. They have to be supportable. They have to explain the reasons for our conclusions. I'm asking you to elevate the quality of your QME reports. And one of the ways that you become a persuasive evaluator, and that's what that whole program is about, the 21 Secrets, and this material today is extracted from that program, so this is one of the secrets. The way you become a persuasive evaluator and a persuasive report writer is to be able to anticipate in advance the issues. What issues? Well, our issues, first of all, the issues that we handle as qualified medical evaluators, issues such as causation, issues such as permanent impairment, issues such as apportionment. You have to an anticipate in advance the issues related to those uh, subject headings, we could call them. But also, we need to anticipate in advance the issues of the applicant attorney, the issues of the defense attorney, the issues of the claims examiner. And the most persuasive evaluators can handle in a preemptive way all of the questions and concerns of each of these parties. So the, the most persuasive and the best evaluators are always thinking in advance, okay, what is the applicant attorney, uh, what's he gonna ask me? How's he gonna object to any of my conclusions? How can I handle that in advance, preemptively? And they handle it. And they're always thinking, how, what's the defense attorney? If we get to deposition, what's he gonna say? What's he gonna ask me? How's he gonna question me? Where's he gonna find the weak spot in my report and they handle it and they shore up that weak spot in advance. The very best evaluators handle this stuff in advance. Well, part of being a persuasive evaluator is reporting and per, is, is performing and reporting a persuasive examination, part of which includes non-physiologic examination maneuvers. So let's talk about how symptom magnification and malingering manifest itself in the qualified medical examination, and I'll show you how that you can persuasively, persuasively provide for accurate opinions and conclusions. And uh, I promised you some discussion from the 2001 Physician's Guide, so I want to refer to that now to get us started off on this section here. The 2001 Physician's Guide uh, was formerly our Bible. We don't use it as much anymore, but it still contains excellent philosophy uh, and some principles that will be with us forever. And one of those uh, principles is the 2001 Physician's Guide's ideas related to pain and the impact of pain on various activities. Now, the AMA guides, the big deal in the AMA guides is activities of daily living. So, whereas the 2001 Physician's Guide talks about pain and pain's uh, impact on activities, the AMA guides talks about the impact of pain on activities, which they refer to as activities of daily living. Well, what kind of activities can, be inter can pain interfere with? It can interfere with all kinds of activities including our physical examination. So just think about that for just a minute, and I'll show you how. Well, uh, on page 43 of the 2001 Physician's Guide, uh, they start us off by saying, uh, this is regard with regards to uh, pain and examinees' reports of pain, 
They say that although fraud and malingering are uncommon, over-elaboration, symptom magnification, and embellishment often characterize pain complaints. How often do these things characterize pain complaints? Does it say that they never characterize pain complaints? No, they say that it often, <laughs> often characterizes pain complaints. Over-elaboration, symptom magnification, and embellishment often characterize pain complaints. We can expect it. Therefore, the credibility of the injured worker must be assessed. And that's our job as evaluators, is to assess the credibility of the examinee and the credibility of the pain behaviors. Pain is a bona fide subjective factor of disability, but this is not synonymous with the patient's pain behavior or complaints. Well, let me give you a little historic perspective on the subjective factors of disability. Uh, prior to the passage of Senate Bill 899 and the adoption of the AMA guides, us as qualified medical evaluators, we provided for opinions on permanent disability which in those days uh, amounted to the loss of ability to compete in the open labor market. Well, with the adoption of AMA guides, uh, we no longer comment on permanent disability. We comment on permanent impairment. And then the uh, raters, the impairment raters, take our permanent impairment rating and come up with a permanent disability rating, permanent disability rating, which reflects the uh, diminished future earning capacity of the examinee. These are totally separate and distinct systems. Before the adoption of the AMA guides and the passage of Senate Bill 899, we used the 1997 Permanent Disability Rating Schedule. Now, as part of that schedule, we provided for opinions on permanent disability in four categories which collectively contributed to the permanent disability rating. <clears throat> we provided opinions on number one, the subjective factors of disability, which basically described the pain. Number two, we provided opinion on objective factors of disability, such as loss of range of motion, um, degenerative change on uh, x-ray studies and all that stuff, uh, work restrictions, and uh, loss of pre-injury capacity. Before the injury, the guy could lift 100 pounds, now he can only lift 25. So we took all four of those and came up with a permanent disability rating. So I want to talk to you now just about category one, which is the subjective factors of disability, the pain. Well, in those days, the, uh, the 2001 Physician's Guide gave us some exact ways to define pain. Now, these are different definitions than examinees use to define their pain. Most examinees will say that their pain is uh, severe, right? They will embellish, over-exaggerate, and magnify their pain complaints. And they'll tell you that the pain is severe. I had an examinee yesterday, she told me that her pain was an eight. An eight. And she walked in with no assistive device, she sat comfortably, she performed examination maneuvers, <laughs> and yet to her, the pain was an eight. But by definition, her pain was not an eight. So I wanna share with you uh, these definitions. And many of you are familiar with these. And then we're gonna relate this to what the AMA guides tell us. So we have four grades of pain under our old rating system. We have slight pain, and then we have minimal pain, slight pain, moderate pain, and severe pain. And this is a gradation of pain based upon how much the pain interferes with activity, okay? So a minimal pain, the lowest level of pain, a minimal pain is a pain that would constitute an annoyance, but it would cause no handicap in the performance of the particular activity and would be considered a non-rateable 
permanent disability. In other words, there's no permanent disability rating for minimal pain. Why? Because minimal pain does not interfere with activity. What kind of activity? You might be wondering, what kind of activity? How about your physical examination maneuvers, doctors? I want to give you some ideas about your physical exam and providing for pain ratings, levels, assessing the impact of the pain on activity in your physical exam. When I explain this idea to doctors, they seem like their doors are blown off. How about your physical exam? Imagine an examinee who you ask your examinee to bend over and touch their toes as you assess lumbar flexion. And as they bend over to touch their toes, they tell you about the pain. Pain! Oh! <laughs> oh, my back! And they bend over and touch their toes. <laughs> and they rise to a standing position. That's minimal pain. That's minimal pain. Because the pain doesn't interfere with the activity. What's the activity? The activity is lumbar flexion. It doesn't interfere with the activity. The examinee bent over and touched their toes. They're able to touch their toes despite the pain. Now, is there pain there? Does the examinee truly have pain? We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. I can't feel your pain. You can't feel my pain. How do we know? All we know is whether or not the pain impacts the activity. Right? If I told you I have pain in my elbow here, and when I bend my elbow up like this, bring it all the way closed like this, oh man, oh, pain, terrible pain in my elbow. Oh, it's like a knife, an ice pick going through my elbow. Oh, oh. That's minimal pain because the pain does not interfere with the activity that causes the pain. What's the activity that causes the pain? It's elbow flexion. But the pain doesn't interfere with elbow flexion. That's a minimal pain. That's different from, ah, oh, oh, can't do it. Ah, can't do it. Now, what do the AMA guides say about minimal pain? This is on page five. The AMA guides don't say anything about minimal pain. Those are definitions that we used in the old rating system. But the AMA guides say on the bottom of column one, they say that a 0% whole person impairment rating is assigned to an individual with an impairment if the impairment has no significant organ or body system functional consequences and does not limit the performance of common activities of daily living. If the pain does not limit the activities of daily living, it's a 0% whole person impairment. That's how we rate minimal pain. Minimal pain does not interfere with activity. So, thus the importance of doing your activities of daily living assessment in the face-to-face -face evaluation with the injured worker, rather than simply just using a form checkbox, because the interview, the face-to-face -face interview, allows you to explore the impact of the pain on activities of daily living.
that was in moderate to severe pain. And uh, she had an acute lower back. And um, she had marked handicap in her ability uh, to walk. And when she walked in, she walked in ever so carefully so as not to move her lower back. And when I got her on the examination table and attempted to do my chiropractic procedures and my maneuvers and manipulations, and as we did maneuvers such as hip flexion and lumbar spine flexion and those spasms set in, uh, she would let out a cry and she would recoil and the pain was severe and the pain precluded precluded uh, the chiropractic procedures and we, we just couldn't do them. She had actual moderate to severe pain and this is a different type of examinee than uh, I'm accustomed to seeing in the qualified medical examination. However, the examinees will tell you that their pain is severe when in actuality it's most likely minimal pain. Okay? Okay. So, we have those definitions that we can rely on from the 2001 Physician's Guide. Let's talk now about uh, what uh, the AMA guides, what the DSM-4, and even what uh, Merriam-Webster says about uh, malingering. And I'll give you some idea as to how malingering uh, manifests itself in the qualified medical exam. Okay, so uh, according to Merriam-Webster, uh, malingering is defined as uh, to pretend or to exaggerate incapacity or illness as to avoid duty or to avoid work. So what kind of duty? How about uh, military duty? How about uh, how about other kind of duty? How about prison duty? How about work? Uh, how about a prisoner who uh, is told that today we're going to go out and lay uh, a mile of railroad track <laughs> in the hot sun? Would that be a ripe breeding ground for a prisoner to pretend or to exaggerate incapacity or illness? to avoid work or duty? It would. Okay, the DSM-4 defines malingering as the intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms, even psychological symptoms such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, uh, motivated by external incentives such as avoiding military duty, avoiding work, obtaining financial compensation, evading criminal prosecution, or obtaining drugs. So let's count these incentives out. Avoiding military duty, uh, avoiding work, obtaining financial compensation, evading criminal prosecution, or obtaining drugs. That's five motives. Now of these five motives, which of these five motives can we anticipate uh, in the workers' compensation setting? Are we going to encounter examinees who uh, attempt to avoid work? We could, couldn't we? We could. They could be attempting to avoid work. Are we going to encounter examinees who attempt to, are attempting to uh, obtain financial compensation? We could, huh? they could be attempting to obtain financial compensation, perhaps in the form of temporary or permanent disability benefits. Could we expect to see examinees who are attempting to obtain drugs? We could, couldn't we? There is a certain percentage of the population uh, that are drug seeking and that are attempting to uh, obtain prescription medications. And so of the five criteria, three of them are possibly present in the workers' compensation system. So we need to be aware of this in advance. We need to expect 
that examinees could have these particular motives. Okay? So what that amounts to uh, is, uh, and this is right from the DSM-4 with regards to workers' compensation, it says that in the workers' compensation setting, this amounts to deliberate and fraudulent feigning, feigning of symptoms. And it's important to understand that, uh, it's important to understand about malingering that the claim of symptoms, uh, the claim of impairment and the claim of disability are willfully, intentionally, and deliberately overstated. It's willful, it's intentional, and it's deliberate, these overstatements. Okay, so that's malingering. Uh, let's define uh, deception and symptom magnification and highlight some distinctions uh, between these three. Uh, according to Merriam-Webster, uh, symptom magnification involves the patient exaggerating or magnifying their actual complaints in order to sell the doctor uh, on the truth of their claims. And as I said in the introduction, uh, I've come to accept a certain amount of symptom magnification uh, to be normal. The purpose of which is to sell the doctors, to sell us uh, on the truth of their suffering, as the AMA guides referred to. Uh, deception. Deception is defined as to cause or to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. To cause or accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. To give a false impression. This may include statements or physical acts, right? We encounter both of those. We have patient statement, examinee statements, and we have examinee acts or examinee behavior. The purpose of which are to propagate beliefs that are not true or are not the whole truth. This may also include omission or withholding of information. And doctors, I want to uh, highlight this briefly. I want to encourage you in your uh, interview technique to always look for the omission. Always look for the withholding of information. Now the opposite of omission is commission. And commission is what the examinee tells you. But the DS uh, Merriam-Webster tells us that many times uh, those who are attempting to deceive us will omit important information and will withhold information. Always look for the omission. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, you have uh, an examinee uh, who reported an injury uh, at 2 p.m., while they were working in the warehouse uh, alone and no one was there to witness it. That's our case. 2 p.m., working in the warehouse, no one was available to witness the incident. No one was present. Where are their omissions in this history? What information is missing that could be important in arriving at accurate conclusions regarding this case? Well, there's a lot. Let me give you some examples. You might pursue some of the omissions regarding uh, the unwitnessed incident. So, for example, you might ask, uh, so, uh, so no one was there at 2 p.m., correct? And the examiner will say, well, yeah, correct. You can follow that up by saying, well, uh, who wasn't there? The examiner might say, well, my boss wasn't there. You could say, well, how come your boss wasn't there? The examiner might say, well, he was on vacation. Okay, well, who else wasn't there? Uh, my partner wasn't there. Okay, well, why wasn't your partner there? Well, my partner had just gone on break. And who else wasn't there? And who else wasn't there? In other words, this is an example of following up on the omissions to find out 
where information is withheld. Always look and always pursue the omission. Okay? So, let's talk about malingering now. Now, the DSM-4 gives us four criteria for identifying the possibility of malingering. Four criteria. And the DSM-4 says that the presence of any two of these criteria uh, suggests a strong possibility for the potential of malingering. And we'll go over each one of these separately here in a minute. Number one is a medical legal context of presentation. Number two, a marked discrepancy between the stated level of disability or impairment and the medical history. Number three is a history of lack of cooperation, either with the diagnostic evaluation itself, your diagnostic evaluation, or with prior prescribed tests and or treatments. And then finally, the presence of an antisocial personality disorder or antisocial personality traits. Okay? So let's go over each one of these uh, individually. Okay? Talk about a medical legal context of presentation. The DSM-4 says that with a medical legal context of presentation, there's a possibility and a probability for malingering. So let me ask you, uh, is the workers' compensation a medical legal context of presentation? It is, isn't it? In fact, they call our reports, they call our reports medical legal reports. We're in the medical legal system. And the medical legal context of presentation is enhanced when the examinee is a represented injured worker. So, we have a medical legal context of presentation. We can check that one off already. It's already present uh, with our examinees. Now, this is not unique to workers' compensation. Uh, personal injury cases where the accident victim is represented by attorney, that's a medical legal context. Uh, some of the disability systems that where the uh, disability claimant is represented by attorney, that's a medical legal context. So, in workers' compensation, we can check that one off already as being existent and pre-existent, okay? What about a marked discrepancy between the stated level of impairment or disability and the medical history? A marked discrepancy. Let me give you an example of a marked discrepancy. What would you think about an examinee who uh, let's say we have a 50-year-old female examinee, uh, five foot five, a little bit overweight, maybe 195 pounds, uh, who has a fall uh, in an office onto uh, a carpeted surface, onto the carpeted floor, has a fall onto the right side of her body. Okay. Now, a fall onto the right side of your body could cause a range of injuries, ranging uh, from no injury all the way to serious and severe injury, correct? If she was to fall and hit her head, uh, she could suffer subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, she could have fracture of <coughs> cranial bones, she could have fracture of the shoulder, fracture of the hip. In other words, there could be severe injury or uh, could be no injury at all. There's a range, correct? Well, this particular examinee uh, was able to get herself up off the floor and uh, didn't think much about it for about four days. And four days later, she presented for her initial medical evaluation and a series of diagnostic x-rays were obtained, all of which were negative for any kind of fracture. There was no skull fracture, no shoulder fracture, no fractures of any uh, axial bones or uh, vertebral bones. Uh, the only significant findings were age-related degenerative changes of the cervical spine and the lumbar spine. Well, she had uh, some medical treatment which consisted of medications and a recommendation for no lifting over 15 pounds. Well, the employer was unable to accommodate the work restrictions, and so 
she remained home on total temporary disability. She underwent uh, six sessions of physical therapy, which did not help. She underwent 12 sessions of chiropractic treatment, which did not help. She was prescribed a home H-wave treatment unit, which she reportedly uses once to twice a day every day, which did not help. Meanwhile, she continued to uh, attend medical appointments for physician follow-up and medications. And when I evaluated her, she was off work for, on total temporary disability for 18 months. 18 months. Now, in your opinion, would you consider 18 months of total temporary disability to be a marked discrepancy between the medical history, which involved a minor injury, no fractures, no head injury, would you consider that to be a marked discrepancy? It could, couldn't it? Is there financial compensation involved? It was 18 months total temporary disability involved. That's an example that could indicate a marked discrepancy. What about a lack of cooperation? Well, lack of cooperation uh, takes many forms. There's, first of all, the lack of cooperation with you and your diagnostic evaluation. And then there's also a history of lack of cooperation with the prescribed treatment up till now and the prescribed testing up till now. So let's talk about your evaluation, doctor. How could an examinee uh, manifest lack of cooperation with the QME examination? What are some ways? How about rescheduling. How about showing up to your evaluation late in an attempt to maybe get it rescheduled or in an attempt to thwart uh, your time frame, in an attempt to thwart your procedure. How about an examinee who shows up to the evaluation uh, without their paperwork completed? It's lack of cooperation with the procedure, correct? How about an examinee who fails to cooperate with examination maneuvers, fails to allow uh, reasonable manipulation of body parts, okay? Uh, lack of cooperation can take many shapes and forms. How can lack of cooperation manifest itself in the medical history or in the diagnostic study history? How about an examinee who attends physical therapy and says after one session, one session, uh, that the physical therapy made them worse. How about an examinee who uh, says that chiropractic treatment uh, after one session made them worse? How about an examinee who has diagnostic studies, but you read on the radiologist's interpretation of the studies that the images were degraded by motion artifacts? How about an examinee who does not take their medication as prescribed? So lack of cooperation can take many forms. Always be alert for signs of lack of cooperation. How about an examinee who's prescribed a chiropractic treatment protocol three days per week for 30 days, but only attends seven or eight out of 12 sessions? Now. Persons with bona fide medical conditions attend treatments that are supposed to help them, correct? Always be on the lookout for lack of cooperation. Finally, the DSM-4 says that the presence of an antisocial personality disorder or the presence of antisocial personality traits is one strong suggestion for the possibility of malingering. So let's define uh, an antisocial personality and then we'll talk about antisocial personality traits. Uh, an antisocial personality disorder is characterized by, this is a quote from the DSM-4, uh, a pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of 
the rights of others, beginning in childhood or early adolescence and persisting into adulthood. A pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. Okay? What are some antisocial personality traits? Well, number one, truancy. Truancy. How can truancy manifest itself uh, in the medical treatment or in your evaluation? Well, that's a person who's late. That's a person who no-shows. It's a person who reschedules. That's truancy, correct? Uh, history of lying and or stealing. Uh, history of substance abuse. That could be non-prescription, recreational substance abuse and prescription medication abuse. Uh, history of depression. Uh, history of arrest. I recently had an examinee uh, who had been arrested 12 times. 12 times. Had spent uh, over 20 years of his 50 years. Over 20 years incarcerated. A red flag for the possibility uh, of malingering. Uh, the use of aliases. I recently had an examinee, uh, and this was the first time this had ever happened to me. I recently had an examinee who had two aliases. He had his regular name, <laughs> and then he had two additional uh, aliases. With me, he was uh, John Paul Jones. But it came out in deposition, and I read the deposition transcript, that uh, in the past he had gone by the name of uh, William Henry James, and before that he went by the name of uh, Patrick Bob Thompson. He had two aliases. And uh, on that particular case, uh, I had very strong suspicion for malingering, and I provided for uh, no industrial injury. That was, wasn't the only factor that led me to conclude for malingering. Uh, but amazingly, uh, for the first time ever, this particular examinee did have two additional aliases. Then finally, uh, the DSM-4 describes uh, what they refer to as superficial charm. Superficial charm is one of the antisocial personality traits. Superficial charm is a person who's uh, socially very uh, funny, a uh, person who's very uh, flowing, a person who's very uh, easy to get along with, a person with, with whom you uh, establish rapport quite easily. Uh, they're fluent with words and they're socially, what's called socially facile. Facile means easy. They're easy to get along with. They have superficial charm. They're even funny. Uh, and they're likable. The DSM-4 describes that superficial charm uh, as one of the antisocial personality traits. So these are some things that you want to be on the lookout for uh, when you get to your evaluation. Some of these things you can determine in advance. You can review the medical records and find out if there's a lack of cooperation. You can review the medical records and find out if there's a marked discrepancy. I found out in the uh, deposition transcript the use uh, of aliases. And many of these things uh, can be pre-established before even meeting uh, with the injured worker. Okay. So doctors, uh, let's bring this idea to a close here and conclude this video. The AMA guides tell us, and the 2001 Physician's Guide tells us, and the DSM-4 tells us uh, that in compensation systems such as the workers' compensation system, we can expect examinees to embellish, to exaggerate, to magnify their symptoms, to even out and out malinger because uh, there's compensation to be gained. Remember, malingering is the conscious 
deception for the purpose of gain. So we can anticipate this in advance. Now, does this mean that every examinee is a, is a symptom magnifier or a malingerer? No, it doesn't mean that. But as we demonstrated in the introduction, a certain percentage are. A certain percentage fall along that bell-shaped curve between the bona fide examinee and the outright malingerer. A certain percentage lie on the bell-shaped curve. So we can anticipate this in advance and we should expect this and we should be comfortable with this. Well, our obligation is to be responsible and to provide for accurate opinions and conclusions and we do that by filtering through the examinee's subjectivity both in their history and in their physical examination. And in our physical examination we integrate non-physiologic examination maneuvers into the substance of our routine examination protocol for the purpose of determining the examinee's credibility. Now uh, we'll talk about how to integrate the non-physiologic examination maneuvers and exactly how to do those on another video. But I want you to agree with me today in conclusion on this video that it is necessary and that's the whole philosophy uh, of this video to, uh, today is to establish the necessity of the non-physiologic examination. So doctors, uh, I know I've given you a lot to think about today. These are somewhat uh, controversial topics and sometimes they're difficult to discuss and uh, I've done my best to uh, highlight some of the key things for you to think about with your very next examinee. So I uh, hope this helps you doctors. This is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I look forward to being with you uh, on future videos. And I thank you for being uh, with me on today's video. And uh, for now, I'm wishing you the very best of success in your career as a qualified 